Okay, this person, I'm going to ask this anonymously because this person asked. Stumbling upon Mother Natalia on your show last year helped lead this wife on the journey to the church. Mm. What advice can you give to a wife who committed adultery, had an abortion, and engaged in years of pornography production, whose husband had a deep conversion to the Catholic faith? That conversion, along with other things, has led her to want to repent of her sins and join the church. But how does she heal? How does she confront the pain and anger that comes with hearing many Catholic programs like this one that reinforce that she committed so many terrible sins and continue along the path to the church? It's easier to just fall back into her lucrative career or become angry or resentful of faithful folk for making her feel like she is bad and unworthy just because the truth is so painful and shameful to confront. How does she give herself over to the Catholic Church and Jesus completely? Oh, bless you. Without just falling back into her sins, feeling like she can't change her life for God or seeking to find problems with the church that will reinforce her demons. Thank you. Ooh. Maybe one of the most beautiful <clears throat> questions I've ever been asked. Um, Thank yeah. You. Yeah. My immediate response is just praise God, like praise God for, for the openness and for, for the desire, um, the desire to live more in union with who you truly are. You know, this is, um, I gave a talk a week or two ago about identity, about, um, the importance of knowing our identity first as, as son or daughter of, of the father, um, and then as spouse and then as mother or father. Um, and I think what you need to know here is that um, like the fathers are so explicit that um, we were made good um, and that as humans, we are good. Um, some, of, some of the fathers say, I think it's, it might be Gregory of Nyssa, I can't remember, but like some of the fathers talk about how um, we we are made to be in union with God. All of the fathers talk about that, but that like they, they say a couple of them, even that there is no such thing as, as man without God, we are either God, man, or we are not man at all. Um, and by, by man, I mean human, right? Um, because it's, this is a problem I think in, in the language that I promise I'm getting to the question. Um, just hear me out, but there's a, a problem in the language that we use today Um, that I notice myself even, and and that I've tried to correct in, um, when we, when we sin, we can sometimes excuse it by saying I was just being human. Um, like I'll go to confession, I'll do better, but I was just being human. Um, and there is a great falsity in that because God, when he, when he became man, Jesus was perfect man. And so to say that to sin is being human is not true. Um, because if, if Jesus was the perfect man and he was, and he was sinless as we know, and as we believe, um, then to sin is not, is not to be man to sin is to be subhuman. Um, and, and this is what the fathers are unanimous about is that, um, when we sin, we are not acting in accord with, with our human nature, our true Mm -hmm. nature, um, our true call to deification, to becoming God, um, Theosis is this concept of of becoming God, becoming ever more in union with God. And when we are being subhuman, we're missing that. And so I think that the the beautiful thing to remember here is that when we are sinning, we are not being our true selves. Um which means that you're now being called to be more truly yourself. I, I don't know any other way to say that. Um, you're being called to union with God and to be more truly yourself. Um, and the beauty the beauty there is that um, when we sin, that's not what, what defines us. And in fact, our good actions aren't what define us either. Um, like it's our very being, it's our very essence. Um, I don't actually know the philosophical meaning of those words. Um, so I'm speaking in secular language here, but like our being is what is good. Um, and, Mm -hmm. and I think that the reason, 
I think that the reason sometimes we want to be defined by our sin is because the implication there is that our actions can define us. And so we think if I can just do good enough, um, if I can just do enough good deeds, then I'm lovable. Um, and then I have a good identity. Um, but it's neither our sin nor our good actions that define us. It's it's the fact that we've been loved into existence, that we've been loved into being. Um, that's what defines us. And so to remember that, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just so much about identity. When I gave this talk on identity, I I, I actually said like, part of the reason this is so important for us to know that it's not our actions that define us. Um, and like when we love, when we are trying to be in union with God, when we're, when we're living more truly and more fully as ourselves, the good actions follow. I don't mean that like what we do doesn't matter. Right. Um, but it's like, it's the identity that needs to lead to the actions. It's not the other way around. It's not the actions that define our identity. Um, And the reason it's important for us to know that in ourselves is because if we can't see ourselves as sons and and daughters of the father, um, then, then how are we going to see that in other people? And I, I really challenged the people, the people that I was giving this talk to. Um, and I'm like prime example of this for years and years and years, only in the past couple of years, really, like, especially in the past few months, have I actually accepted that I am good, that I am beautiful. Mm. Um, and, and it's, it's helped me to be more able to see the goodness and the beauty in others um, in, in who they are and not just in what they've done. Um, And, and I challenged these people when I gave this talk, like, can you see Christ in the addict? Can you see Christ in, in the pedophile? Can you see Christ in, Mm. in the one who is um, committing adultery? Right. Um, because Christ is in this woman. And, and I think that she is going to be more deeply aware of that when she accepts it mm. than, than most people ever are. Um, the one who is forgiven much is the one who loves much. Um, and yeah, so I think that there's like so much beauty and so much gift that can, can come from this. Um, so I just want, want to commend all of that, but, but to know I was reflecting last year on, um, do you happen to know off the top of your head, Matt? I'm really sorry to put you on the spot like this, but um, what is what happens right before Jesus starts his public ministry? He goes into the desert. And what happens right before he goes into the desert? He's baptized. And in at the baptism, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved mm. son. Before Jesus starts his public ministry, mm. what he hears from the Father is, you are my beloved son. Before a miracle has been performed, huh? Before, mm. yeah, before any of that. Like the first thing that he hears is, you are my beloved son. And we know that this is important and we know that it's what each of us needs to hear because then when he goes into the desert, what's the first thing the devil says to him? I forget. If you are the son of God, ah, wow. do this. I not made if that you are the mm. son of God, <laughs> do this. It's like, like I've, the devil is told. immediately testing that identity. Mm. He's immediately saying like, yeah. And, and, and obviously Jesus knew, right? Jesus received that from the father. Jesus knows I am the son of God. Like that's not going to be, but, but we call it the temptation in the desert. Right. Um, and, and I think this is the greatest mm. temptation that all of us experience is to question our identity. Um, and, and so we have to lean fully into that. And until we can accept our identity, the rest of the things don't matter. Until until we realize um, I really am a daughter of God and I really am loved, then I'm going to constantly question what my actions mean. I'm going to constantly question whether or not doing this thing or that thing makes me loved or unloved. Um, yeah, so I think that's like, we really, really have to focus on the identity. I would say really briefly, and that was beautiful, thank you. Um, to this woman, you know, the same God who forgave Moses the murderer, Rahab the prostitute, David the adulterer, Peter the denier, Paul the Christian persecutor, will forgive us as well. Um, and then think what he wants to do with you, with your with your story of pain, how you can then reach into the hearts of others and say, I've been in the sewer as well, and neither of us are doomed to remain there. 
Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.